Welcome to the Deep Dive, the place where we turn, well, huge stacks of research into actionable knowledge. Today we're tackling something that sounds a bit like sci-fi, but it's a very real uh, existential threat, the quantum threat. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a future computer, one that could basically shatter almost all the encryption we rely on globally. Think financial data, government secrets, your personal info, all potentially exposed. Now this urgent need for a new kind of digital shield, it's driving this uh, massive tech arms race. And right there at the bleeding edge is the company we're focusing on today, BTQ Technologies Corp. You'll find them trading as BTQ on the NASDAQ and CBOE Canada, and also as NG3 over on the Burst Frankfurt. And here's the real head scratcher, the central puzzle from the sources you shared. Today, October 16th, 2025, BTQ is trading around $10.91 USD. Okay, fair enough. But that gives it a market cap of roughly $1.76 billion USD. A huge number. Right, huge. And here's the kicker. It's trailing 12-month revenue, the actual money coming in over the last year. It's only about $654,000. Wow. Okay, so $1.76 billion market cap, $654,000 in revenue. That's quite a gap. It's monumental. I mean, this stock is a classic bet on the future, isn't it? It's a pure narrative play driven by this idea of future compliance needs. Our own analysis, just running the numbers through a standard DCF model, even with pretty aggressive growth assumptions baked in, well, it suggests the educational intrinsic value is much lower. We're talking maybe $2.50 to $5.50 per share. Right. So our mission today really is to figure this out. Is BTQ genuinely building the, you know, the digital fortress of the future? Or is this sky high price just quantum hype, pure speculation. Okay, yeah, let's definitely unpack that valuation puzzle. So the plan is, we'll start with their business strategy, which seems quite unique, kind of a dual approach. Mm -hmm. Then we'll look at the management team, their build and buy strategy you mentioned. After that, we absolutely have to confront those uh, eye-popping financials. And we'll wrap it all up with a full risk assessment, including some uh, maybe unexpected geopolitical angles affecting their hardware plans. Hashtag take part one, the fundamentals. Hashtag take check chapter one, business analysis. All right, chapter one, business analysis. So the core business, it's all about post-quantum cryptography solutions, PQC. And looking at the sources, it seems they're not putting all their eggs in one basket, which, yeah, well, that probably suggests they understand the risks here, right? This market's still pretty new. Oh, absolutely. That's a key point. Their model is uh, quite diversified. Mm -hmm. They're doing hardware. They're doing software. So specifically for things like blockchain and IoT. Mm -hmm. And they're also licensing their intellectual property. It's a deliberate risk mitigation strategy because, frankly, nobody knows for sure which PQC standard or approach will win out in the end. And what's quite clever is their revenue model. It's designed around transaction volume fees. Ah. So if and it's a big if, if they achieve scale, there's potential for massive margin expansion built right in. Interesting. OK, let's get into that product strategy then, because you mentioned this split, this kind of two pronged approach, quantum defense and quantum offense. Exactly. Quantum defense is about protecting current systems right now. Think of their QCIM product, quantum computation in memory. QCIM. Got it. Yeah. And forget the jargon like soft IP cryptographic accelerator for a second. The key idea is this is security designed to be built into devices that don't have much power or memory to spare, you know, like tiny IoT sensors or maybe wearables. Security for the small stuff. Makes sense. Okay. And then there's QSSN. Right. QSSN. That's the quantum secure stablecoin network. This one's aimed at digital currencies, maybe even central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. And it's not just theory. Your sources show it's already in proof of concept stages. They're working with some big names in Korea, uh, Danil and Finger Inc. group. OK, so real world testing happening there. Mm -hmm. And then you flip to the other side quantum offense. This is more about harnessing quantum power for future applications. You've got OSS, one-time signatures. The ambition there is huge. Mm -hmm. They're talking about transforming the like $150 trillion financial payments market. Ooh, okay. And then QPOW, quantum proof of work, that's about creating a low energy way to validate blockchains. Sort of an eco-friendly alternative to Bitcoin mining, maybe. Hmm. Interesting angle. But let me just, you know, play devil's advocate for a second. If this whole PQC market is set to explode, you mentioned a 46.2% CGR in forecast. Yeah, blistering growth predicted. And it's being driven by mandatory compliance, like the NIST standards coming down the pipe. Why wouldn't the giants, the Googles, the IBMs, the Microsofts, just crush a smaller company like BTQ? 
Why would anyone choose a company with, what was it, $654,000 in revenue? That is the critical question, isn't it? And BTQ's answer, their value proposition, seems to be speed focus and, crucially, this developing IP mode. They've got, I think the number was 15 patent documents filed, 10 already granted. Okay, so they're building protection. Exactly. And their focus is quite specific, especially in those areas like constrained hardware, the IoT space, where maybe the giants are a bit slower to adapt or it's not their main focus. It's about being agile, nimble, and leaning on strategic partnerships, too, like with Cambridge University. Right. Agility is key. And speaking of strategy, there was that point about their geographical advantage, yeah. placing the core tech team in Taiwan. Yes. That's quite unique and potentially very smart. Taiwan is the global hub for semiconductor design. Being there gives them, theoretically, a huge efficiency advantage for developing their hardware, like that Ccash H cryptographic engine they're working on, faster iteration, better access to talent and manufacturing. Makes sense. Direct access to the ecosystem. Hashtag tag tag chapter two. Management evaluation. Hey, chapter two. Management evaluation. This flows nicely from strategy. The CEO, Olivier Rossi Newton. Mm-hmm. This background is interesting. Co-founder of HIV blockchain. Mm -hmm. That definitely signals, you know, experience in raising capital, navigating the public markets, which must have been crucial for getting that NASDAQ listing recently. It absolutely signals that. But it also suggests perhaps expertise in markets driven by, let's say, high expectations and maybe even high, highly speculative cycles. Right. Like crypto space can be. Precisely. And you see that reflected clearly in their capital allocation strategy. It's explicitly aggressive growth. It's build and buy. Yeah. They are not uh, prioritizing profitability right now. Not at all. All the capital is going straight into R&D and acquisitions. Yeah, the sources mention specific examples. Buying Simtex IP, that strategic investment in Q perfect for the software side. Yeah. And then AquaHire basically hiring a team by buying their company of the Radical Semiconductor co-founders for the TH engine. Textbook growth stage strategy, build internal expertise, buy external tech or talent where needed. And as you'd absolutely expect with that strategy, there's zero history of share buybacks, no dividends. Why would there be? And their return on invested capital, the ROIC, it's deeply negative, somewhere around negative and then 10% to negative and then 30%. They're burning cash to build something. Right. A pure R&D machine, as you said, hmm. which uh, brings us quite neatly to the financials themselves. Hashtag tag tag chapter three, financial analysis. Okay, chapter three, financial analysis. Let's face the elephant again because these numbers are just stark. That $1.76 billion market cap versus $654,000 in trailing 12-month revenue. It almost gives you whiplash just hearing it, doesn't it? And the profitability metrics, well, they tell the same story. Operating margin is around negative 667%. Net profit margin, roughly negative 707%. Minus 700%. Yeah. I mean, that's not just a loss. It feels like a strategic decision. They are actively choosing to burn cash at this rate to fuel that build and buy approach we talked about. And right? the cash burn itself is accelerating, right? The free cash flow trend. It is. TTM free cash flow is negative $4.87 million. And the trend is definitely heading deeper into the red. It's a direct consequence of the R&D and M&A spending. High stakes investment, plain and simple. But, and this seems like a critical, but based on the sources, there's a counterbalance here, right? Their balance sheet. Yes, exactly. This is probably their biggest financial strength right now, the source of their ability to keep spending like this. Their balance sheet health is, frankly, pristine. The company is effectively debt-free. Zero percent debt to equity. Zero debt. Okay, that's significant. Very significant. And their short-term liquidity looks fantastic. The current ratio is super high, about 6.80. That means they have almost $7 in current assets for every dollar of current liabilities. They have a really strong cushion. They have the runway to keep this R&D fire burning for a while. Got it. So they have the cash to survive the burn rate for now. Mm. But those valuation extremes... How do we quantify that speculation? P.E. is useless, obviously. Right. Negative earnings mean no P.E. So mm. you look at price to sales, P.S. Yep. And it's, well, it's kind of mind boggling. It's 2,500 times sales. 2,515. Yeah. That number basically screams that the market is valuing the story, the potential, the IP, the narrative. Yeah. Anything but current financial performance. Okay. So that leads us to trying a different valuation approach, like the DCF model you mentioned earlier, but more as an educational exercise. Exactly. A discounted cash flow model tries to estimate today's value based on future expected cash flows. But for a company like this, 
the future is incredibly uncertain. The execution risk is just enormous. So to even attempt a DCF, you have to use a really, really high discount rate to account for that risk. We landed on something like 20% to 25%, which is very high. Okay, so super high discount rate because of the risk. And you combine that with, well, optimistic assumptions about growth, like that 46.2% initial revenue growth from the market forecast. Mm, plug all that in. And what does the math spit out? What does this educational model suggest the value might be based on those inputs? The result we got was an intrinsic value range of around $2.50 per share. $2.50 to $5.50. Okay. So compare that to the current trading price of nearly $11. It tells you investors are paying a massive premium right now, almost double the high end of even an aggressive educational valuation. It's a huge bet on hope and flawless execution. Hashtag take part two. Market dynamics and risk. Hashtag take, take chapter four. Market sentiment. All right, part two. Let's look at market dynamics and risk. Starting with chapter four. Market sentiment. How's the market feeling about BTQ? Well, it's a bit contradictory, actually. If you look at analyst consensus, it's currently a strong buy. So generally positive sentiment towards the underlying tech and story. Okay, strong buy. Seems bullish. But here's the weird part. Their average 12-month price target, uh, based on the sources, is somewhere between $10 and $10.20. Hold on. The target is below the current price of $10.91. Exactly. Isn't that interesting? It suggests the analysts, they like the company, they like the potential, but they're looking at the recent run-up in price and thinking, whoa, maybe it's gone a bit ahead of itself. Cautious about the current valuation, perhaps. Hmm. Yeah, that is a strange disconnect. What's been driving the positive sentiment that got the price up there in the first place? Well, there have been some real positive catalysts recently. That high-profile NASDAQ listing back in September 2025 was huge for visibility. Plus, the successful QSSN proof-of-concept deployments in Korea we mentioned, that adds credibility. And they've been successful in attracting some top-tier talent, too. Okay. And technically, how did the chart look? Um, mixed picture. Short term, it seems to be struggling a bit. The price is currently below its 50-day moving average, which is around $14.84. So some recent weakness. Right. But the longer term trend still looks positive. It's holding comfortably above its 200 day moving average, which is down around $9.22. Hashtag, hashtag chapter five, ownership structure. Okay, moving on. Chapter five, ownership structure. Who actually owns BTQ stock? This often tells a story. It certainly does here, and it presents a major paradox. Let's start with institutional ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, the big funds, the pension plans, the so-called smart money. It's incredibly low, only 0.23%. 0.23%. That's exactly. that tiny. It's minuscule. For conservative investors, that's often a big red flag. It means the established players haven't really bought into this story or this valuation yet. Mm. Okay, lack of institutional validation. But then you look at insider ownership the people running the company. Right. And it's the complete opposite story. Insider ownership is exceptionally high, 31.9% in total. Wow. Nearly a third of the company owned by insiders. And get this, the vast majority of that, 30.72% is held by the CEO, Olivier Rossi Newton himself. 30%, just the CEO. That stake is worth something like $424 million at the current price. Okay, well that's certainly skin in the game. Yeah. A $424 million personal bet that creates some serious alignment with shareholders, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's a powerful signal of confidence from the person at the helm. You can't argue with that level of alignment. His success is directly tied to the stock price. Hashtag, hashtag chapter six, risk assessment. All right, let's pull it together in chapter six, risk assessment. We can use a SWOT framework, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Okay. Strengths are pretty clear. They have proprietary IP, that growing patent portfolio. They've got world-class talent, especially with those acquisitions. Mm. And critically, that zero debt and strong current ratio, the healthy balance sheet. Right. Weaknesses are also pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Negligible revenue, high cash burn rate, and the fact that their products haven't really proven commercial scale yet, it's yeah. still mostly potential. Exactly. Opportunities lie in that massive, fast-growing PQC market driven by compliance needs. But let's focus on the threats, the external risks. Competition seems like a big one. Huge. You've got the tech behemoths, Google, IBM, Microsoft pouring billions into their own quantum research, both offense and defense. BTQ is constantly at risk of being leapfrogged technologically. Technological obsolescence is a constant shadow. Mm -hmm. And don't forget the macroeconomic environment. As we discussed, BTQ is a long-duration asset. Its value is based on profits way out in the future. So if interest rates stay high or go higher, that increases the discount rate used to value those future profits, which inherently puts pressure on its current valuation. It compresses it. 
sensitivity to interest rates. Got it. And there was one more specific risk mentioned, a geopolitical one tied to the hardware. Yes, this one's interesting and maybe less obvious. Remember, their core tech team is in Taiwan, but the company itself is Canadian. The issue is the March 2025 U.S. 25% tariffs on Canadian imports. Oh, the trade tariffs. How does that impact an IP company? Well, it impacts their hardware ambitions, specifically that QCIM chip, the cryptographic accelerator, if they plan to manufacture or assemble that chip in Canada for sale into the huge U.S. market. The tariffs would hit hard. Exactly. A 25% tariff could make their product uncompetitive on price, forcing them into costly changes to their supply chain, maybe shifting manufacturing elsewhere. It turns a potential hardware advantage into a potential trade victim. Hmm, an unexpected complication. <laughs> Hashtag tech tech chapter 7. Conclusion. Okay, chapter seven, conclusion. Let's synthesize all of this. What's the elevator pitch for the bull case on DTQ? The bull case is this. You're getting a pure play investment in a non-discretionary essential market quantum security that's projected to grow at over 40% a year. It's protected by a developing IP moat, led by aggressive management whose own fortune is tied to the company's success, and they have a rock solid balance sheet giving them the time and money to execute. Okay, compelling potential. Now, the bear case. The bear case starts with the valuation. It's astronomical. That PS ratio of over 2,500x is pricing and perfection, maybe beyond perfection. Then there's immense execution risk. Can they actually scale from an R&D shop into a profitable commercial business? It's a huge leap. And all this has to happen while competing against giants like Google and IBM who could potentially outspend or out-innovate them. So the final outlook. Where does that leave us with the current price around $10.91? Yeah. Well, it's pretty clear that $10.91 is significantly higher than what our educational DCF suggested, even the high end of $5.50. Investing in BTQ today at this price feels like a very high conviction bet. It requires near flawless execution from management. They need to capture a dominant share of this market to even begin justifying this valuation. It really is a fascinating case study, isn't it? Revolutionary technology priced for absolute perfection. Yeah. It really is. And it leaves you with that question. Given the high insider ownership, the zero debt providing that runway, mm -hmm. how many years of burning cash do they actually have before the market demands real, substantial, profitable PQC products? Yeah. It's definitely a high stakes situation to keep an eye on. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for sharing the sources for this. It was a really challenging and interesting deep dive. For everyone listening, if you found this analysis useful, please do like and subscribe to Stock Analytics AI. It really helps us out. And remember, for just $499 a month, you get access to our full playlist. That's 500 deep dive videos covering all the S&P 500 stocks. Plus, coming up next, exclusively for members, we're tackling the NASDAQ 100. Oh, and members can also request specific stock deep dives. Just drop the ticker symbol in the comment section and we'll get working on it for you. Finally, just the necessary disclaimer. This analysis was generated by an AI system. It's intended for educational purposes only and should definitely not be taken as financial advice. Always, always do your own research or consult with a qualified financial advisor before making any investment decisions.